Excited today to have a basketball coaching conversation with Tab Baldwin. Tab has been the head coach in so many places, coach, that we can't even cover that probably in one podcast. But uh, welcome to the podcast. And uh, most recently, you and I got to connect with each other at the, uh, the Jones Cup in uh, Taiwan, where we had some good basketball conversations. And I know you have so much to share in your years of experience. And uh, most recently, coaching the Ateneo uh, Blue Eagles of the University Athletic uh, Association uh, in the Philippines. And, um, you know, coach, you coach in world championships, you coach national teams. Clearly, you're coaching a university team as well now, but uh, tremendous experiences. So excited and welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Chris. And it's, uh, you know, it's great to be here. It's great to share this time with you. And, uh, this, you know, you're a coach. I'm a coach. There's really nothing better than sitting down with coaches and talking basketball. Well, and that's the point of the podcast, and we've had so many great conversations already. And, uh, you know, for, for many coaches that, that don't know you and will we'll kind of hear about you for the first time, Coach, uh, how did your life experiences move you across the world to be an incredibly successful coach? For those that, uh, you know, certainly haven't Googled you yet, I mean, uh, incredible success at uh, basically all levels of coaching. Well, thank you um, for that, that kind intro, but – uh, my father was a basketball coach. I grew up in Jacksonville Beach, Florida, and he coached high school basketball for a long time. He was a, uh, a former captain and uh, All-American at the University of Notre Dame back in 1933. So, uh, you know, he kind of uh, wrote one of the textbooks of old school basketball, really. Uh, you know, he started in the game that long ago. Very so much a fun Coach, when he saw when he would see you isolating some of your guys against us in the game, would he be in favor of that or no? <laughs> oh no, no, he was spinning. He was spinning on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he wasn't in favor of that at all. Sorry, Darren. Um, keep going. <laughs> so he was a fundamentalist, you know, really from the word go, and and uh, taught me a lot about the game, um, and and really opposed me. Uh, I, I also went to the University of Notre Dame. Uh, but strictly for academics, because dad opposed me continuing anything in basketball after high school. He said, you're too short, too slow. So, you know, go learn something about the world and make some money. And uh, for me, I tried. I graduated with an accounting degree, tried it for a couple of years. But, you know, I, I missed the competition of, of the world that I loved, which was basketball. And uh, even though he opposed me, and, and in those days, you know, uh, a conservative uh, father could have, could oppose you even when you were a grown man. I worked my way back into the game and um, coached for a few years at universities. Uh, University of Central Florida was my last stop in the U.S. And I just wasn't uh, satisfied being an assistant coach, you know, young and dumb, Chris, as we all are at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I got an offer to go overseas to New Zealand, not knowing anything about New Zealand or international basketball. And uh, the only question I asked was, is it a head coaching job? They said yes. And so that really started me on the sojourn that I've been on for, uh, you know, over 30 years internationally with lots of ups and downs. And uh, I had some downs in New Zealand before I had some ups. Well, isn't that amazing, though? I mean, just you're going across the world for essentially your first head coaching job and I mean, that, that's an amazing story that I don't know if we could paint that story nowadays, but uh, clearly, again, you've taken advantage of that opportunity. And, and for those that have never been to New Zealand, I mean, what an amazing country. Your my eyes must have been wide open when you got there. Just beautiful country everywhere and incredible people and great sports people as well. Yeah, fantastic sports people, but didn't know much about basketball, you know. And um, when you talk about the outback of Australia, we were like, we were like the outback of the outback down in New Zealand. And it just so happened that not only did I go to this place, New Zealand, but I went to the south of New Zealand, which, you know, if I could double down on the outback of the outback, uh, a town called Dunedin, a little Scottish town uh, in southern New Zealand, coaching a second division team, no less. So that was really my introduction. And like you said, phenomenal people the first weekend i was there i went down to this isolated beach and i saw a penguin and a bunch of seals all by myself and i you know uh, how otherworldly that was and i'm a big outdoorsman so I, I i thought i had died and gone to heaven 
but wow. basketball was a different story there. So, uh, you know, I, I really went someplace where I could get away from all of the history that existed in the game and in my life and, and start fresh. Well, and it's amazing. I mean, New Zealand basketball clearly has is, is gotten much better uh, through the years. And, uh, you know, and I know you were a part of that development. And uh, probably that was a good segue, Coach, when you said otherworldly into coaching in the Philippines. Like, people don't appreciate the, the passion and the love that the Philippines has for basketball. And I know we had a quick conversation about it. And I know I was exposed to a small part of that in Taiwan with just how much they love basketball. And it's another level in the Philippines, isn't it? Look, there, there's really nothing to compare it to apart from possibly Lithuania and, and Serbia, which, you know, even a, a casual basketball fan should know how passionate and how great those two countries are at producing great players. But their love for the game is, is paralleled only by what goes on here in the Philippines. And I would, take, I would think it's even a step further um the entire country of the philippines and, and with lithuania and serbia you're talking about relatively small populations you know under 10 million uh, here we have 110 million people and literally everybody literally is passionate about the game and you know nowadays more women are starting to play it and girls are starting to play it but all men play the game you know, really until they can't, you know, go faster than a walk. You know, if, if you can still jog, there are basketball courts and hoops up on, you know, street poles, uh, light poles, coconut trees, uh, sides of buildings, everywhere. Everywhere you go, you, you turn down a side street in the downtown Manila, and there will be kids playing in the street with a basket nailed up to a, you know, your regular light pole. You walk down a beach and there'll be a coconut grove just off the beach. And it's nothing to find a group of kids playing even full court with no court, just sand and, you know, a basketball and two hoops up on two coconut trees. I mean, this is common. This is not sort of, oh, every now and then. No, no, this is common. And you can YouTube it and see some incredible video of, of Philippine basketball. And it's really, if you love basketball, it's, it's entertaining to do that. So, yes, you're right. Nothing like it, I believe, on the earth. Well, and I know I've, I've gone back and watched some of your games, actually, that are on YouTube from, uh, from the, the Blue Eagles and some of those university games. And uh, just, again, amazing. And uh, some of the PBA games, I know, again, just incredible passion, incredible basketball. And, uh, you know, Coach, your, your team, uh, let's get into some of the stuff that uh, we can talk about and share with coaches. And, uh, you know, obviously I was impressed with your team and how they competed in some of the things. One of the quotes that you've said before, that I really liked was uh, the greatness of an opponent brings out the best in us. Can you talk to that a little bit about some of your, your philosophy and some of your approach to how you coach and develop young people into better people? Look, I, I don't think you can exist in the game as I have for as long as I have without developing, you know, philosophical ideas and even beyond that, an ideology of, of what coaching should be about. And, and uh, you know, I've been so blessed to be able to keep jobs and stay employed in a, a tough industry uh, internationally. And um, so throughout all of that, you know, I've experienced a lot and, and almost all of that was with professional players. It's only the last few years and the first few years that I've coached, you know, universities. And now at Ateneo, we have a, a phenomenal philosophy as a university about development of young, young men particularly, but, you know, young people. And so I felt it was incumbent upon me to not just be a coach at Ateneo, but also to take on board the development of young men. And I've enjoyed it immensely. And um, yes, we, we pour a lot into uh, not just trying to win games and win championships. In, in fact, our philosophy sort of eliminates that. We are all about developing our players so that they can realize their dreams and aspirations in, in the game. And through that, using basketball as a vehicle to formulate dreams and aspirations for success in life. 
And, you know, the quote that, that you roll out there, I, I think that part and parcel of being able to do that is to pitch yourself against superior uh, competition, superior talent, superior knowledge as a coach and as players. Because it's in failing that we recognize personally what our weaknesses are. And as a coach, you know, I'm constantly pointing out to my players what their weaknesses are. But it's not until they go out and test themselves against other competition, fall short, that they begin to say, okay, I, I now, I'm now hearing, you know, I'm not just listening to the coach. I'm starting to hear what the coach is saying. And I'm starting to realize personally, uh, you know, these things that are being pointed out to me. So now I can channel my work into improving myself. So for, for me, I don't, I don't ever want to go out and just win games and, and seek to win championships. I want to go out and put my players and put my team into an environment where they recognize their limitations because our limitations are temporal. You know, we, we are not limited by what we can do. We are limited by what we think we can do. And once we realize what those limitations are, then our mind expands and it allows our skills, our talents, and our knowledge to expand with it. And that's, that's what learning is, I mean, in, in my humble opinion. Well, no, and that, that's great. And uh, the, the other quote that I saw that just sparked when you said all this was that you, you said at some point that your goal is to unearth the star in every player. And I, and I love that phrasing of that. That's tremendous phrasing to say, that our, our goal, what, you know, whatever level they get to, they're going to be a star. You know, it, there's going to be a star in every player. Can you talk to well, that a well, little bit? Sure. I mean, I, I you know, I'm, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and I'm a believer in God. And, you know, I believe that, that we were created with immense potential. Everybody, every single human being. Our conditions are very, very limiting in this earth. There are people that unfortunately you're never going to have the opportunity to realize their, their personal potential. And what I, what I prefer to call that is your personal genius, because I think inside of us, there's something so special that it is a type of genius that if we can only tap into that, then there is a star there. And, and you know, a star is in and of itself is nothing. It's not until other people see it and recognize it that, we are able to capitalize on that. So, you know, I think that that's where our genius should be on earth. And, you know, as a coach, I really believe that that's part of my responsibility is to help my players find that. And, you know, for some, it may be, you know, having great court vision and, and be a great court general and lead their team. For others, it may be that they have that, that wonderful knack for scoring and, and creating and, and so on and so forth. For somebody, it might just be that they're the greatest screener that ever played the game. And within that, and in the sport of basketball, they realize phenomenal potential and success with their team. So, you know, the, the ethic that, that underpins that philosophy is hard work. There's no question about it. Um, you just can't achieve without hard work. And People pay far too much lip service to that. It is something that must go far beyond what is demanded of you. It must be something that you crave yourself, you know, to get up without anybody telling you, figuratively, get up. And that might mean the moment you walk in the gym, you get up and then you go to work. And I think once you do that, then you'll start learning how to work smart. Very few people work smart first. They learn to work hard, and then they figure out along the way that there's a better way to do this work. And it's not shortcuts. It's just working smarter. And I think once you figure those two things out, you're really on your way to, to recognizing you're the genius that you have inside you and, and hopefully realizing that and being in an opportunity. And that's where I think some of us have, are blessed and some of us aren't. Uh, but have that opportunity to recognize that personal genius and realize it. Uh, coach, uh, like we're talking now about university players, but I assume you maintain this philosophy whether you're coaching pros or university or you know as well in high school players in America. I mean, the, the philosophy doesn't change for the level, does it? 
Can you get a little bit? The same it one? does. It does a little bit, Chris, because I think that you know, with university players, you're you you've got you know play doh in your hands. They're very malleable. They're looking for this. They're looking for discipline. They're looking for guidelines in life. Uh, they're looking for ways to find those things in themselves that they haven't found yet. With pros, they should be doing the same thing. But many of them have, you know, started the process of closing the doors. And, you know, they, they get beyond it. And I think in America, unfortunately, this happens at an earlier age. Unfortunately. Well, I found um, it with the guys that I coached, uh, even in the, in the Jones Cup. And, like, I, I felt like I had to constantly remind them. Somebody paid for you to come to Taiwan to play basketball. No matter yeah. what's going on, let's connect with that experience first and keep reminding yourself why you're here and who you're representing. You know, and, uh, it, you know, even simple things like please and thank yous, things that I assume someone should have at that point in their life, clearly <laughs> are still things you have to address. And, uh, you know, it, it was amazing to me. You know, you focused on me for this podcast, but I would be remiss. You know, when, when I first saw you and I first saw your team, I actually thought, and I told my guys, I said, hey, we're going to beat these guys. You know, they got a lot of talent, but they haven't been together long, and they're searching for some chemistry. And that was evident in your timeouts. Yep. It was evident talking to Ted, who had, you know, helped yep. assemble the team with you. And so I felt like our chemistry was our big advantage at the Jones Cups because we've been together a long time. And so, I, you know, I, I watched you guys because we played you, I think, what, second game or third game? It was like a little third deeper. game. Yeah, no, it was deeper than that. It must have been the fourth game, Coach. Okay, yeah. fourth game. So I think it was our third and your fourth because right. our off day was the first day. So <laughs> Which is crazy to have, I know. When you have to play eight but, games in nine days, you don't want your off day to be the first day. Yeah, you know, so for us, it was eight and eight days. Yeah. But anyway, you know, I was scouting as I do and, you know, trying to trying to read things. And I'm sitting there watching you, and I could tell you were a university coach. I could tell, I could just, you know, I didn't even need to know that about you because I could see the way you were trying to get through to people, not just players. It was evident right away. And I thought, I thought you know, honestly – Coming from America, knowing the task that you're going through, I thought, man, this guy's going to have a hard time. I should have been smarter because yeah. I should have realized that you won it last year and you were probably in a similar, you know, situation. And by the time we played you, I told my team, I said, hey, we're going to go out and jump on these guys. And we're going to beat these guys. And man, I've never been <laughs> jumped on so hard. It's how you guys jumped on us in that game. You know, yeah. and that's a credit – to exactly what you're talking about. You know, the effort that we have to make as coaches to get through to the people within the player. And if you can do that, and you obviously did, if and, and in such a short period of time, if you can do that, then you can start, you know, to really find your way to help young men realize something so much more than being able to hit a jump shot or break somebody down off the dribble or you know, execute a triple post action. You know, you've really got something. And, and we at, at Taneo, we strive to do that really every day. That is our goal right there. And, and we don't really talk about things beyond that. That's it. Yeah, well, that's, and I noticed that with your kids. I mean, the resiliency they showed. And, and as you said, the cohesion. And we'll get into that a little bit. because I mean, I, I was super impressed with not just your team, but a lot of the Asian teams in terms of and how they competed, how they played. We knew that our one advantage and, and us winning had nothing to do with talent. It had everything, sorry, it had everything to do with talent, but it had nothing to do with coaching in the sense, in the sense that it was like X's and O's coaching. It was, as you said, it was about management of players and, and connecting with them in some way bigger than themselves. And I, I, I just, just all those little daily conversations or, you know, little conversations, whether it's on WhatsApp or whatever, with my guys to get them to just say, hey, appreciate it and play for each other. And uh, no, I was happy. But uh, coach, let's but, talk about but Chris, Sorry. but Chris, that is coaching. No, and I get that. <laughs> you know, that is coaching. And, and that's why you deserve a lot of credit, because you just can't walk into that scenario that you had and 
take for granted that you're going to be able to diagram some stuff, run through some actions, and these guys are going to go out and play. You did a lot more than that. And I don't want this to turn into a, you know, a mutual back padding thing, but you deserve credit for that. And, and I want to make sure that I give you that credit. Well, and I appreciate that. Thank you, coach. And, uh, you know, because I'll be honest, I was sitting there. Our first game we watched, it was uh, Iran against Lithuania. And Lithuania was obviously down at this tournament. You should be yeah. a better team. But even watching those teams and the way they were running stuff and executing, I, I knew that our execution wouldn't be at that level. And, uh, you know, and, and let's get into that. Like some of the some of the trends that you've seen in, in international basketball or Asian basketball that maybe you can connect back to coaches around the world to say, hey, these are some things that are happening and these are some things that maybe you're not paying attention to that are really helping the game. And let's start with the first thing, Coach. You guys ran handoffs out of the low post. That not just handoffs to the to the ball side wing, but you were run, run handoffs to the top of the key. And I thought some of those actions were tremendous. You were talking yeah, about we, we, we've gotten away. Again, Europe is my learning ground. You know, I, I pay such close attention. I have a lot of good friends coaching in Europe, at, you know, after the years that I coached there. And I, you know, I, I'm a big thief. You know, I should be probably be Japanese, you know, because, you know, I try to see what's going on out there in the world as the Japanese have done such a phenomenal job. Look at the auto industry, you know. I try to see what's going on out there and, and learn from it and then adopt it. And then if I can do it better with my players, I'm happy. I don't need to be an innovator, you know, because I think there's such good knowledge out there. So you say we ran handoffs. What I learned a few years ago is that you don't want to hand the ball off. You want to execute what's what we call a pitch pass. So it's, it's a very, very short pass, which – allows the ball handler to, to control the ball a little bit longer than he would with a regular reversal pass, which gives him the opportunity to, say, turn the corner if he sniffs out a switch or, or something like that. But we don't want to go directly to the handoff because a lot of teams started to counter handoffs with double teams and traps. So the pitch pass allows you to avoid that because it gives you more of a ball screen action than a handoff match. So the pitch so, pass creates more space. Just for, a little bit. Yeah, yeah for the player just, to get it. Yeah. Correct. Just enough to prevent the man guarding the basketball from slipping into that hard show or into that, you know, blitzing, trapping mentality. Because if he does that early, you just keep your dribble, turn the corner, and go straight to the rim. And we train that. You know, we work on that. Of course. So, now I'm going to get asked, Coach, because – you know, the pitch thing scares some coaches because, again, what happens if uh, suddenly at the last minute the defender jumps out and denies the cutter? Then oh, That's the, the cutter's responsibility. So, so his read is if, if the defender is coming hard to disrupt that, that pitch pass action, then you backdoor him. You know, and so, you, you know, you would have seen us run, you know, quite a few backdoors and, we even use the back door as a decoy sometimes, you know, really to put that defender in two minds for the next possession so that it takes a bit of the pressure off of the pitch pass. So we tell our players, you know, you don't always have to have a denial defender to back door. Just have an opening to the rim to back door. He may cover it, but at least it puts in his mind that he's defending more than one option, which is a hard cut to the ball. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that answers your question. So for us, the, the pitch pass, and it can work, as you said, in any direction. So we'll go, you know, inside out, you know, towards the wing with the pitch pass, but we'll also come back in and we'll also, instead of executing a pitch pass or a back door from the wing, we use what's called a flat cut. So when you back door, you don't go to the basket you go towards the big man who is making the dribble pitch, pitch pass action and you kind of rub screen his man and allow him to turn the corner and go to the rim. Extremely difficult to defend. And then off of that, you can run some other counters for your screener. So uh, I like the offense, not because it's a continuity offense. I generally don't like continuity offenses like a, a flex or a shuffle or a, 
you know, a continuous triple post action. Uh, generally speaking, I don't like that. Um, but at the same time, there, we, we build so much variety into this particular continuity offense that it's less continuity and more, um, you know, lots of variation built into a consistent action, if right. I could say that. Yeah, no, and I want coaches to know that, again, when we're talking about your continuity, it doesn't look like a continuity in the sense that it's not spot to spot. There's reads, there are decisions, and, uh, you know, very, very, it might be structured in its genesis, but in reality, it's very unstructured because of the decisions and reads players are making. Is that correct? That, that's absolutely true, and, and we really strive to teach the game from the basis of decisions. That, that for us, is everything. And we're working with young players who are playing, especially Filipino players, because over here they tend to, uh, the culture is very much of a hero ball mentality and a superstar culture, because literally the whole country watches you. you know, so it's very easy to become a star here if you dominate the basketball. So we fight that mentality and, and we try to teach that, you know, you, your every action that you take, particularly at the offensive end, should be designed to help a teammate improve his position so that he can help the next teammate improve his position until ultimately it becomes terminal and somebody has a great shot opportunity. So, you know, with that sort of thinking, the more structured and continuous you are, the more predictable you become and the more difficult your decisions become because defenses know what you're doing. So we have to break that mentality by creating more variation, as I said, within the movement. But the more variation you have, the, more, the, the bigger the premium on making good decisions because you do become less predictable. And so does everybody else on the court. So now you've got to be decision-based and, and everything that we do in practice is designed to help our players become better decision makers. Well, let's talk about that, Coach. What, what, what are your practices? Are they drill-based? Are they game-based play? What are some of the things that you do in practice that you found successful to help them learn decision-making? Again, speaking now exclusively about university-level players, and this would be true of high school level, we're not limited here by any time restrictions. Um, so we don't, we don't have in the Philippines a basketball season. The basketball season is from New Year's Day to New Year's Eve, literally. <laughs> that's you know, that's so a long season. <laughs> it's a very long season, but it's a great opportunity as a coach to teach the game. So we, we finished our season last year on December 5th. Uh, we gave the players a break. We told them, get in the weight room and, and uh, you know, do your CrossFit work. We gave them some structure for that. And then we started again on January 22nd. So literally, we, it was about, you know, five-week off-season. And so when you ask what do our practices look like, we go through phases throughout the year. And our biggest phase is from late January to early June, and, and it is individual development. So we test our players. We're pretty scientific. Uh, we test them not just physically, but in terms of skill and fundamentals. Uh, and we have quite a, a significant battery of tests. I think we have about 14 skill tests. And uh, from that, we build an uh, individual drill sequence where the players are pigeonholed into the areas of weakness as priorities. So if you've got problems with your footwork and shooting, if you've got problems with your you know, ball handling and traffic, if you've got problems with your passing strength or passing accuracy or rim attacks, we will prioritize these in your daily training. So our daily trainings were quite unique in this sense. So the first hour we split our team, first two hours, we split our team into two, half go in the weight room for an hour. So we're big on hypertrophy. We're big on building muscle and the other half go into the video room and when we go into the video room we look at mostly european basketball mostly euro league we break it down and we teach the game we're a university so we believe in teaching teaching the game of basketball we want our players to be knowledgeable basketball players and um 
So we teach them what is a flex cut. We teach them what is a shuffle cut. What is a triple post action? What is a stagger? Offense and defense. How do you exploit it? How do you capitalize it? What is spacing? What is timing? What are angles? Why are these important? So we do this for six months, or five months, and um, virtually every day. And then we go on the court. So you say, well, you're two hours into your practice. Yes, we're two hours into our practice. So we have three-hour practices. So now we go on to actually three and a half. So now we go on the court for about 45 minutes of individual drill work. And then um, we spend about the last 15 to 25 minutes in um, working on breakdown drills of whatever we talked about that day, whether it be a flex screen or, you know, whatever. So that's the first phase, and it's the long phase. And then uh, after that, we start to, to build our offenses, and we work whole part, whole theory. So we show them how it works five on zero, and we break it down into component parts. And then we rebuild it, and that consumes a big part of our practice. And then the last phase is, is the last month, and now we're into uh, very intensive five-on-five -five, uh, scrimmages. With every, every day our scrimmage has a scenario, so we play second half of a game every day now, 10-minute uh, quarter, then 10-minute quarter. And one team emulates what our opponents – in the UAAP will be presenting to us. So every day is a different opponent. And one team represents uh, what we do. And so by that way, we are playing our preseason games without exposing ourselves to, uh, you know, to our opponents very much. Right. So, and that's, that's before your main competitive phase, that, that, uh, that scrimmage scenario, right? Is that, is yeah, that one month. Yeah, yeah. One month. That's, that's really cool. That's but in the Philippines, we get an awful lot Jones Cup being one. We toured Greece. We took our team to Greece. We played games there. We play in a lot of summer leagues. So we actually get too many games. We've probably already played over 60 games, and we haven't even entered our season yet. So there's a lot of that, too. Question. Yeah. The, are you playing games in some of these phases, too? So you are. And before you get into the main schedule, you played a lot of games. A lot. And, and we don't prepare for them. We, right. don't, we do zero preparation for games. We literally stick to the philosophy of our phase. And the games are just sort of, you know, we just go out and play them, uh, do the best that we can with our systems. But we really evaluate our players on an individual basis through these summer leagues, what we call our summer leagues. No, it's great stuff. Uh, Coach, um, I noticed a lot of weak side actions that uh, a lot of the teams at the Jones Cup, like Korea especially, you guys especially, a lot of weak side actions, uh, you know, not, not just a special play, say a hammer, but weak side flares, you know, sometimes some hammer actions. And you guys, I, I don't know if it was, it was it, I didn't watch every game you guys played, but, you know, kind of double actions in the post where it'd be like two different cutters off the weak side. You know, all that by design, is, is that something that you noticed a lot more, you know, over in Asia and the Asian leagues or? Um, originally picked up a lot of that in uh, Europe um, of playing weak side actions off of post entries. And so you would have seen, we always extend our post. You know, we, we want spacing. We want to open up the rim for cutters and slashers. But, because I think if you can force a weak side defense to pay attention to the rim, in today's game, you know, you, we all evolve shooters in our programs or we recruit shooters. So if you can force attention to the rim on the weak side, you can always pop out some shooters, you know, around the top of the key or, or you know, pro lane or elbow extended on the weak side. And, and we work a lot to that. And that's we, – we call it trying to get a lot of east-west in our offense. You know, not everything just being dribbled and attack the rim. We want the ball going east-west first or reversals. And then off of that, you know, we can get our north-south action. So your high-low actions or your shuffle cutters. But you've got to establish the east-west. And I think to do that, you've got to get the defense preoccupied with the rim. And once they're preoccupied with the rim, all your reversal actions become much easier. So you've got to have legitimate cutting actions into the paint. And if you've got the ball in the low block, you, you know, it's too easy to defend. So we extend our post, and from there we work off of it. But, you know, you bring up a good point. The weak side action 
a little bit from Europe, but then when I got to Asia and I, and I coached against Korea, you know, I was, it blew my mind how so good right they on. are. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they just, they, they kill you because, you know, they, they take the preoccupation with the ball, which many, many defenders in the world have, and they exploit that. So while you're there in a weak side position, standing there looking at the basketball, they're sealing you, pinning you, flaring you. You know, they're, they're taking advantage of poor defensive fundamentals, which so many players have. And uh, so learning that was, was a, you know, I think a great thing for my coach. Oh, it was a great thing for me watching it because, again, I want to clarify for coaches, it wasn't just on post actions. It was, was basically any time within the flow of play, Korea would, I assume it was a read more than a set play, and they would just see an opportunity to pin, say, the top player and help on the weak side. And, you know, it, it was con – and they shoot the ball so well that yeah. it was just constantly a problem. And you had to be really aware on the weak side. And, and because of that, you couldn't help at the rim as hard and you couldn't help at the post as hard. So, uh, yeah, it was really good to see. We're certainly bringing aspects of that. The other thing that I thought Korea did really well was uh, they would send a weak side cutter along the baseline, uh, you know, to the ball side, which, which is kind of like old school basketball when you'd run your wings and they'd cross. And, um, you know, I hadn't seen that for a while. Like, obviously, a lot of basketball now is to run hard to the corner, to the 45. And, you know, that, that weak side cutter, man, that, that guy was tough for our guys to follow too because of what you said already, which is that preoccupation with the ball. Yeah, I mean, they, they do a lot with cutting, you know, which I love. I, I think that that's really – that's real basketball, you know, instead of, you know, somebody dribbling the ball and you standing there and then we force your man to help and now you're just a stationary shooter. You know, to me, Europe sort of evolved that out of the ball screen offense in the 90s and, and early 2000s, and, you know, in Europe, there was nothing but ball screens. Now they've integrated movement prior to the ball screen. This is the new, the new trend in European basketball. So now you're going to have to defend a whole bunch of sequential action before the ball screen, which means you can't, what we say, you can't sit down on it. It's a football term, you know, American football term. You know, you sit down on the quarterback's eyes and read him. Well, that's what defenders became very good at doing in Europe because there was – Offenses were static except for the ball screen action. So defenders got good at sitting down and reading. Now, you know, they've evolved that into a lot of movement. But Korea is, is very dynamic movement. Uh, it is structured, a lot of it. But e they will even have their rim runner in transition turn around and flare screen the wing in transition. I mean, that's how committed they are to flare screens. But the baseline cutter is really... It has a dual purpose for the Koreans. One is it gives you a strong side cutting action. But the other thing is it empties the weak side for your flare screen action from the top. So that guy cutting, he empties that side. And I've capitalized on that by trying to make basketball, which again is happening in Europe with, if you watch the, the Spain ball screen action. Yeah. Spain is trying to turn the game of basketball into what it should have been from the very beginning. And that is a game of four on four. Basketball shouldn't be five on five. It'd be a much better game if it was four on four. It'd be much cheaper too, by the way. <laughs> Not to mention. But I've tried to do the same thing by taking that baseline cutter and using my best wing post player to teach him how to, to stay down in the in the loop position or in the baseline post-up position while we run a flare pin-down sequence. We didn't run that at the Jones Cup. It's, it's sort of a late innovation in our system. So now he's emptying the weak side, but he's also a high-low option or a low-post option, but he keeps the wing corner area empty. So now we've got four-on-four -four basketball with a post option but not four out. Right. So we get a, a lot of screening and uh, ball screening action, but it, it, it's, it's difficult because he's got to be clever in, in how he uses the space in the block. So it's something we're working on pretty hard right now, and uh, it, it's, it can be tough to defend. Great. Well, I look forward to hopefully seeing that at some point, Coach. And masking actions, as you said, um, you know, actions before the actions. 
I, I was I was fascinated because obviously I watch a lot of European basketball and I'm just in, in love with all the multiple actions. But what I noticed at the Jones Cup was our one advantage was is that certain teams would run those masking actions without ever trying to attack. And it gave us opportunities to pounce on them, so to speak, because we had some length and athleticism. And, you know, after the first few games, we said to our players two things. We said, pick up hard at half, so make sure we get the initial pressure point at half. And then as they get in those actions, that gives you an opportunity to actually gamble a little bit and get out in passing lanes. And I found that very disruptive to certain teams that could, like yours, say, who couldn't attack us in matchups. And uh, it was just fascinating because it exposed the danger of too much masking against certain teams. Yeah, I, I mean, the preliminary actions have to have teeth. You know, if, if you've got a ball screen, you know, that you want to evolve through some preliminary action, those things have to be real. You know, they, they have to have – they have to keep the defense honest and they have to keep them occupied. And that's the whole purpose of, of running what you call the masking actions. But what you guys did so well, which isn't done a lot in Asia, we're trying more. But because in Asia, most of our guards are very small, and, and then we find a few big men, switching is very difficult for us to do systematically. You, you can switch opportunistically, but you guys switch systematically, and you used your length and your quickness to be disruptive. And, and this is something that personally I have a, a great belief in. And, and so when I try to recruit, or even if I'm in the professional ranks, the number one physical attribute I'm looking for is length. You know, I, I want long arms and disruptive players, you know, because then you can switch and that negates so much offensive action that you have to defend. So you guys did that very well. And, you know, what we've been working on at Ateneo is a, is a whole new defensive system, which I thought you guys kind of by proxy employed at times. We call it active weak side. So we now want our weak side defenders to not be ready to help. We want our weak side defenders to actively disrupt strong side actions all the time. All the time. We have... No point at which you're on the weak side where you are not charged with the responsibility of disrupting strong side actions. So that means cheating, gambling, being out of position. Because in the game today, everybody wants to dribble the ball. So, okay, you know, you want to dribble the ball, we're going to commit more defenders to the dribbling area, to the attack lines that you are trying to exploit as a dribbler. And we're going to make you pass the ball. Because I believe passing is becoming a lost art in basketball. Well, and it's a great point, Coach. And it also leads into another point, which is you, you kind of, by, by nature doing that, you're kind of deciding what's going to beat you and what's not going to beat you. We're Absolutely. saying, hey, this, is, this is the game that's being played now. This part is not going to beat us. And if they're going to beat us, this is how they're going to do it. And I, I love that aspect of it because – you know, I think all great coaches shape their team in that way, that they know at the end of the day, if they're getting beat, this is what beat us. We know what's going to beat us. It goes back to Dean Smith, you know, and, and, you know, I remember in my formative years as a coach reading something that Dean Smith said. He said, we want to make our opposing coaches waste their practice time. Well, nowadays, it's not just the coaches, it's the players. Because players have become so adept with the basketball through their skill development of breaking their man down, beating them, and, and creating. You know, I think the hockey assist is something that's dying in basketball because now everybody wants to either go get to the rim and finish, shoot the three, or dish the ball to the guy who's going to finish. So a lot of players are not now playing the game to set up the set up man which I think is a lost art in the game, but I also think it's an inherent weakness of players. So now scouting of individuals is just as important as scouting of systems. In fact, I think it's more important today because a lot of players have a great move and a so-so counter move. You know, it's not like the day when Kareem had the sky hook, but he had the turnaround jumper too if you overplayed the sky hook too much. Today, they aren't so good with their counters. 
So as you said, once you know what a coach or a player does to beat you, you take that away. And if the counters aren't that great, you can really cheat defensively to take it away. And that's, that's really what we're working on with our active weak side defense. Well, and Iran brought that up to me because, I mean, I, I was so impressed with them. I mean, just the toughness and the skill and the execution of certain things. But that, that one handoff action they ran where I was thinking it was like three or four handoffs before they actually got to the main action, which ended up being a flare for one of their great players to get them into space. I mean, that was one of those examples of saying, like, and, and again, I'm sure they learned from that experience that if teams can get up on those actions, it disrupts right. the whole play. And uh, it, it was so fun to see. And I think in such a short time, as, uh, as you know, in a tournament, it's sometimes hard to make adjustments uh, to know what's right. But, uh, Coach, you talked about finishing at the rim and, different, you know, different concepts like that. But, man, I was really impressed, too, with how, you know, I call it a wide layup, like a layup that doesn't get quite to the rim but is close enough to, to, to warrant a shot. And I, and I just thought there was such skill from your players and uh, you know the Taiwan players and a bunch of players at hey, Korea about getting close to the rim, but not quite to the layup position, but still shooting it on one, one foot or something, you know, and, and scoring. And there's so many shots that were made that I kind of look to our players or my assistants that just shake their hand. That's a heck of a play. Is that something yeah. that's taught extensively over there? I think so. And again, possibly because you have a lot of, you know, shorter players that, you know, if they get all the way to the rim, they might make a great move, but that, you know, they can't finish either because there's an intimidator or a shot blocker there. And part of the intimidation might be that, you know, they're 5'10", 5'11", 6 foot, and it's only a 6'5", 6'6", athletic guy who's, you know, changing shots. And then when you get into internet, international basketball and, and, you know, just to, uh, digress for a second you know you mentioned going to a tournament like this isn't it so much fun to go to a tournament where you see so many different styles of basketball from different nations and, and cultures that you know I've, I've done it for many years and I love it but back to your point we do teach it um, you know we drill really hard on rim attacks uh, and we use a variety of rim attacks you know and, and that includes Probably what you're talking about is is the floaters or the you know the abbreviated drives. So rather than trying to get all the way, you know you pull up and either you know bank it from an angle or or float it if you're in the middle. Um, and a lot of guys here in Asia, even you know they shoot the one-handed layup. So it's not about elevating; it's about getting the ball to the backboard before the, the rotation gets there. Um, so yeah, you know that that's. That's something we do work on. We work on it all the time, and uh, it suits our style of play here. And, you know, we don't get a lot of guys getting all the way to the rim and dunking it, things like that. So No, and I like that term, abbreviated drive. That's that's really what I mean, and uh, you put that into words for me. But, uh, yeah, no, I know – I'm glad you mentioned, too, the one-hand scoop. Like the – you know, I mean, Steve Nash, I guess, made it popular in the NBA. Correct. Right. You know, that type of thing where it's just a drive. You don't touch it with the other hand. You just get it up without a jump and uh, just change the timing of the shot blocker. And so no, that, that was that was uh, obviously very effective for so many players and, uh, you know, everything else. Coach, what are some of the things you see ball screen defense? What are some of the things that uh, you are finding effective? Because, again, at, at all levels of basketball now, the ball screen is, is certainly a huge part of the game. What are some of the things that you believe in in terms of ball screen defense? That's it's the hardest question. I know. <laughs> That's the hardest question in the in the game of basketball. You know, it's it's dependent on your players. You know, what are their attributes? What you're trying to do with your defensive system? We, you know, I mean, in coaching, I've done clinics on ball screen defense. You know, I've identified eleven different ball screen defenses. So, you know, it's it's pick your poison, and you can even get so detailed with it that against certain guards you use certain ball screens and and uh but you know i've gone through so many uh if you've got it okay let's if you've got a shot blocker you probably want to we call it mushing but i think it's playing soft you know so dropping, when the guard comes yeah. off the ball screen, dropping yes you know you you want to you want to force the guard to attack you without giving up trying to stay in the passing lane to the the rolling guy so that affects how you teach your players to roll. You know, um, 
there's hard shows, which, which I think are good, but you got to work on it a lot to, you know, get your rotations correct because good offensive players are going to quick slip that and put pressure on the back of your defense. There's double teaming. There's switching to zone. There's switching, you know, the man. And then there, there's triple switching, you know, where you try to eliminate the mismatch the best you can. I think they all have merit. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't think that, that there's necessarily a right and a wrong. Um, but the biggest thing in ball screen defense is that the big man and the guard both know what system is going to be employed on that ball screen. Because, you know, you, if, if your big man is mushing and your, your guard is, you know, switching, you got a problem. You give up a jump shot. Uh, so communication, as was taught, when I was a little kid, you know, communication on the ball screen is first and foremost. And then second is, you know, uh, execute very well what you're trying to do. And third is, although you don't want like like the big trend now in ball screen defense is defend it with two guys. Try not to commit a third player. Um, but the third player has got to be ready. You know, you right. can't give up the roll to the rim. Um, so... Which gets uh, into that question about where you tag from and where you help from. Correct. Or if you tag. Yeah, if, if you tag. tag. But, but based on what you're saying with your kind of new system defensively, then you're giving some players on the weak side freedom to be able to be more involved defensively in the ball screen defense. Uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, we're doing some quirky stuff as you can with kids because the skill level of the offenses aren't so great. Can't do it with pros because they pick it up real quick and, and they'll exploit it. Um, but, uh, yeah, with the young kids, you know, we'll, we'll take the guy who's being screened and we'll run him away, you know, to the corner shooter and we'll run the other guy, you know, from the corner, you know, all the way through and, and, uh, hit the rolling guy. And I, I, you know, we do some funny stuff. Um, but just going back to the fundamentals, one of the real fundamentals of ball screen defense that I'll bet you a lot of your listeners that are coaches don't teach and don't teach well. And I, I can't even teach it well because it's, it's hard. Is we mandate that the player being screened does not contact the screen. You do not run into the screen. And I remember my brother, one of my older brothers, played at a very high level. He played in the NCAA finals back in 1971. And he was a real tough physical point guard. And, he still maintains today. He tells me today, he goes, ah, you're soft. He goes, the best way to defend a ball screen is to hit the screener so hard that he'll get out of your way the next time. I said, well, <laughs> you know, in the modern game, maybe, you know, you can't get away with that. But, you know, we still have a lot of guards that run through screens or run into screens. And it really is the worst thing in ball screen defense. You've got to avoid the screen. You've got to stay engaged in the play, even if you're trailing your man, at least you can take away the jump shot. So that, that's a, a real fundamental that we teach. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, you know, that part that you said about really it's, it's about the big man and the guard being in sync in their communication and understanding of what each other is doing. And the other thing that became clear this summer as I was talking to some pro coaches is, and I, and I guess I never coached this the way I probably should have based on my thinking and after experiencing the Jones cup is that the player on the ball should not be peaking. They should not be looking for the ball. They should be doing what you're saying, which is immediately connecting with the ball, making sure they're not going to run into that screen. And it's a responsibility of the player defending the screen to make sure that they know where it's coming and where it is. And, you know, and when I went back and watched film of some of my guys that I thought struggled with ball screen, you know what? almost by and large, the player on the ball who struggled, it's because they were peaking sometimes. They're looking and going, where's that ball screen? Well, don't worry yeah. about where the ball screen is. That's, that's that two-man synergy that you talked about. Well, I tell you what, if you believe in your ball screen defensive system, if you really believe in it, if you think that, you know, we're, we're pretty good at defending ball screens, then you should actually, when, once your on-ball defender, you know, is communicated with and here's there's a screen coming, you should actually force the man to the screen of course. instead of trying to avoid it. But if you don't believe in your ball screen defense, then don't do that. <laughs> you know, try and beat the screen. Um, 
But I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that's emerging in ball screen offense, which is creating massive problems for good ball screen defenses, is teams are, are going to the force you to go under the screen by extending the screen and then rescreening you, you know, and that rescreen done well. Man, I'll tell you, you know, because it's really hard to go under and then re-engage your man so that on-ball defender can execute his principle correctly. Because on that rescreen, you almost always hit it. Or you trail so far that, you know, you're, you're not engaged in the play and now we have to rotate another defender. So I'm seeing more and more European teams, they're saying, we'll set the first screen just to set up the rescreen to get you out of position. And I think that's an excellent offensive ball screen tactic. That's great. And, you know, Coach, I don't think it was necessarily designed, but with Japan's guard, Japan had a really small, quick guard for those uh, that maybe haven't watched some of the edits I posted. But he was tough to cover, and but he couldn't shoot it. So we'd go right. under on him, but we had to remind our guys, you can't go under, under. You can't yeah. go under, under. If, if you go under, they're going to – bring the screen down lower and you can't go under on the second one. Cause then again, he's, he's got all those advantages you talked about. So I'm glad you brought that up. Cause that, uh, that, that's tremendously difficult, but easy to execute in a lot of ways for a lot very of easy. very easy, very easy. Yeah. And it gives you what you want from the ball screen without changing your spacing. Cause you know, a lot of times defensively, if you can force the ball screen into bad spacing, it's much easier to defend. But with the rescreen, you don't sacrifice anything in space. You know, you, you keep it right there in that same spot, just closer to the basket. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's an excellent tactic. Well, that's great. Well, we'll look forward to that in uh, both, of our, uh, both of our programs this year then. Uh, Coach, uh, I always get asked, and I wanted to ask someone like you who's been around the game for so long. I get asked a lot by coaches about what's the best way to call plays? Like, is there a play calling system that you you trust and believe in at this point? If there was, I would I would have <laughs> kept doing it. <laughs> so that's what I say. I mean, it's it's just change it every year. Me too. You know what we've done this year? I'll tell you what we've done this year. We think we're cute, and we're clever, and you know we're we're really smart. We sit around the office and try and devise how to call plays. Right? It, there's nothing more inane than that. <laughs> if you if you have a uh, you know, a deep system, you don't have to worry about it. But what we do is, is we mask all of our set plays behind our primary offenses. So uh, say our, our motion offense, it's a primary offense. It has a certain look for initiation, okay? So when we want to run set plays, we make it look like motion in the initiation. So we mask the initiation, but obviously we need a, a call that is different than motion, right? So it might be fist or it might be one, for instance. And you can't avoid calling that. So what we, we're, we're trying to be clever this year, and, and I don't even care if my opponents listen to it, but try to figure this out. We have four, four primary offenses that we switch back and forth to within a game, okay? So we call our primary offense, and we won't vary from that for several possessions. It won't be until we get to a timeout or a dead ball that we will change our primary offense, okay? So say we call our primary offense fist, and our other primary offense is down, okay? So say we run five possessions of fist, and within that, we might run fist one or fist um, side, right? So we won't call fist side. We'll just call side. And everybody knows that we're running it out of the fist setup. Okay? So now when we go to our second primary offensive system, which is down, and we call side, it's an entirely different play than the other side that we call. So, you know, this is how intricate we're trying to get in calling our offenses. We have fist side, but we also have down side. And we also have shirts side and, and head side. But we don't continuously call our primary sets. We just call it once and stay with it for multiple possessions. So now when you scout us, 
you got to know the difference between four different plays that are called side. The hard thing is teaching your team to do, to do yeah. that. Hey, Coach, that's, that's, that's why I don't put much weight behind scouting anymore in that way. Yeah. Just – it's just, it's just so hard to know everyone's plays. And we focus on us knowing how we defend actions no matter what the run of it. But, hey, I really like that. And, Coach, that's basic English, right? That's a root word. There's a root word. And then there's an addition to that root word. And, I mean, it. in a sense, it's simple. But in another sense, as you said, your players have to be real good at understanding, uh, you know, those four different base offenses and then figure Thank out how you. to Yes. You just gave me a better way to explain it to my players. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I really like that. And, uh, you know, as I said, when I ask all levels of coaches, you know, it's it's one of those baffling things that for all these years of basketball, we haven't got a, a play calling system that's refined. But uh, I really like that. I really like that. So that's that's good. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll try that. And we'll circle back at some point and uh, have another podcast maybe at the end of the year. But uh, – Coach, are there any other things you want to highlight for coaches that, uh, you know, maybe they can do better or maybe, you know, you're seeing as trends or anything uh, just to, just before we wrap this up? Look, the, the best advice I can give, I think, I think uh, is generated from my failures over my career, which there have been many. And many of those failures, both in managing players, both in uh, not getting it right, during a game, coaching a game, or, or even, you know, my approach to practices and, and uh, in motivating players, you know, I can trace that back to when I was a younger coach and for many years being caught up in my self-importance, you know, in, in thinking that the coaching role – now, don't get me wrong. I think it's extremely valuable, the coaching role. And I think that there is value in it. And as a mercenary professional coach, I want people to pay me for my value. But when we stack our value as a coach up next to the value of our team, all of our players, you know, the, the accumulation of our players, because I don't want to talk about individuals and I don't want to talk about the concept of with the name on the front of your jersey. I want to talk about the construct of the addition of all your players together. We are minor. And we need to understand that. You know, many, many of the mistakes that I've made in coaching have been because I got my ego involved in whatever the issue was. You know, and I don't think that I was, when I was young, I don't think I was particularly egotistical any more so than many other coaches and probably a lot less than many. My father was a very, very humble man and he, he taught that, but I don't think I was a very, very humble man when I was young, but I think what I have learned and the easiest way to avoid getting your ego caught up is that you, you genuinely walk onto your practice court and dedicate yourself to your players improvement individual. You know, what could possibly, when you were a player, I'm talking to all the coaches, when you were a player, didn't you play the game to realize your dreams and your aspirations? And without knowing it, didn't you expect the coach to help you achieve that? So when you flip that around as a coach, really who gives a damn about your dreams and aspirations? It isn't about you. You had your time. The game of basketball is not about the fans. It's not about the TV cameras. It's not about the owners. It's not about the name on your jersey. It's about the dreams of the kid that picked up a basketball, shot it, and got a thrill when it went through the rim. And he wants to do that all the time. That's what the game of basketball is about. As a coach, I believe it is absolutely 100% our responsibility to help our players realize those dreams and nothing else. People ask me a lot of times, Chris, you know, God, you've been coaching a long time. What's your, what's your record? You know, how many, yeah, I don't have one anymore. I stopped counting the wins and the losses and the, the championships and everything else. 
I enjoy what my players enjoy. And I assume the responsibility of helping them enjoy as much as they possibly can. And a lot of times that means they don't enjoy practice. You know, you work them so hard that they don't enjoy it. Or they don't even enjoy the, the critique from me as a coach. But it is all toward a greater end. And that end is, what do you dream about? When you say to a young man who walks on your practice court, what do you dream about? And I ask every player in my program, what do you dream about? What, what is your goal in basketball? And then it becomes my job, my goal, and my dream to help them realize theirs. The, the most exciting day for me every year in the Philippines is draft day into the PBA, our professional league. That's the most exciting day because it's that day I get to look at the faces of my players when their name is called because they just realized the dream. And so, I, you know, that would be, I think, the most important advice I could give to a coach. Coach, it couldn't be any better than that. And that's why I'm so glad that uh, you agreed to come on the basketball podcast and, and share some of your insights. And, and, and we'll just leave it at that because that was tremendous. And I hope uh, everyone that listens uh, gets something out of that message. And, uh, you know, there's a greater purpose to what we do. And uh, you just expressed it perfectly. Coach, amazing. Appreciate you coming on. And, uh, you know, again, we'll do this again. And I know you and I will keep in touch as well. And, uh, you know, very fortunate to have met you. Thank you. Chris, it's been fantastic meeting you. I have so much respect for what and how you do your job. And I want to say thank you for this opportunity. I want to say God bless you and God bless all of the people. And I hope many watch the podcast really to listen to you too. And, uh, and I thank them for the dedication that they they give to the, the game of basketball and to, to the players. And, and really, I mean it when I say God bless you all because our work, you know, I believe is an extension of, of what Jesus came here to do and in a funny sort of way. And uh, if we do it well, we are certainly spreading the gospel. So uh, thanks a lot, Chris, and all the best to you for your upcoming season.